Thank you, Susan. Uh, in the same, same region, a little bit further north, we'll, uh, we'll ask Ju Kolhasi from uh, Samoa to come and uh, present on some of the work that he's been doing there. Ju Kolhasi is the, um, the Deputy CEO or the Planning and Urban Management Agency in Samoa. He's been instrumental in establishing that um, unit and, and really, I can, I, may I suggest, has been quite a leader in the Samoan um, planning community and leading them forward. So, Jude. Before you. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Um, first of all, let me acknowledge the uh, support from Pia in getting me here and my colleagues also from the Pacific. Um, again, going back to what Paul and Max were saying, you know, it's without that support that we're, we keep begging for and, and quite need urgently. Um, so thank you for this, um, Sonia and Michelle. My presentation is uh, a little unorthodox. I'm anchoring it in also in the tsunami that affected Samoa on the 29th of September, two, 2009. Um, can I see a show of hands who's familiar with Samoa? Other than the Man Samoa? Okay. Um, just in terms of geography, we're just above about 3,000 3, kilometers uh, above New Zealand. Uh, we're in the Polynesian um, Triangle, so we're part of the, that group of people. We're homogeneous, like um, Paul Jones um, identified earlier. Um, we have a strong Christian um, background, so that will also play out in my presentation about how we rationalize things in terms of the psychological effects. Um, unfortunately, the Manu Samoa didn't make it through to the semis or the finals, but four years' time, let's hope. Um, so the, the session th that I'm presenting on is about how to govern. So I'm really looking at how crisis management uh, requires strong public leadership. Um, and I guess uh, what happened in Samoa is that what, what we went through was having no problems to an immediate, within 30 minutes, we had a deep crisis on our hands. Um, so basically, this is an overview of my presentation this afternoon, um, going over the summary of, or basically the facts of that event. Um, the policy, uh, public policy situation which we had in effect and helped also facilitate some of the responses um, in that crisis. The assessments that were done uh, rapidly and immediately after the event and also which led to the response actions and the support from uh, various agencies and um, from the international community. And Towards the end, I'm trying to draw in the strategic and operational challenges that were identified. Um, as you'll note, the tsunami affected some of the north coastline, not necessarily the southern coastline where the city is. So going on the theme of the Commonwealth cities, we'll try and draw some of the linkages um, from that event to the urban environment or the capital city of Samoa, Apia. So I think one of the important things to identify is that through this period of challenge that we were in, um, it's important to acknowledge that uh, responding to this really does pave the way for socioeconomic development, both at the national level but also in the urban context. So again, on the 29th of September 2009, we had a rare occurrence, which is basically two simultaneous earthquakes, much larger than the Christchurch one at 8.0 on the Richter scale. Um, this was about 100 kilometers uh, south um, of uh, Samoa, along the Tongan Trench, um, where there's that subduction zone um, along the Ring of Fire. At 6.48 was the event, um, and I can recall that moment. Uh, it's just basically twilight when you're waking up. Um, you're, li you're still lying in bed, still trying to adjust and waken. At that particular point in time, we did feel those rumbles, and it lasted for approximately one minute. A lot of anecdotal evidence suggested it was about two to three, but it was about one minute where we felt that 8.0 earthquake. Our immediate response was, as you do, is get under some safe um, structures. And at that particular point in time, we did look outside, and we saw all the 
the buildings um, movement, um, lateral shifts happening. Um, and about 10 minutes later, we received texts. Um, the text indicated that there was a tsunami warning and that people had to evacuate immediately. Um, we were quite fortunate because we didn't receive the brunt of that, but about 10 to 15 minutes later, uh, two series of um, uh, tsunami waves, which exceeded about 14 meters, struck that southern coastline, uh, sorry, the northern coastline. At that particular hour, point in time, we were evacuating up to Highland and we were watching and observing the coastline retreat, which did not retreat on this side of the coastline. So we switched on our radios and we started to hear the reports coming through from that coastline about some of the impacts that they were receiving. As part of that information that was coming through the radio was a number of fatalities that were um, evident. Um, the tsunami affected about 51 districts. This is pos uh, approximately about 15 to 18% of the total population which resides along this area. The total loss of life by the 2nd of October was accounted to 143 people lost and the extensive damage to physical and economic assets as well and pretty significant impact to social and environmental aspects. I must note that um, this was a regional tsunami that also affected Tonga, Niue, um, and there was also some loss of life there as well. So just a demonstration of um, the Upolu context. This is uh, one island, um, largely um, about 50% of the total population reside on um, Upolu Island. Um, the, I don't know if this is a pointer as well, no? Yes? <laughs> ah, okay. This, <laughs> This is our urban um, capital. I wouldn't call it a city yet, but we've, we've yet to define the urban boundaries, but we'll get into that later. So this is largely where the effects of the tsunami was largely felt. And then you also have it as the wave refraction was heading towards that side of the islands as well, and Savat is on this side. So these are some of the devastation that was identified following the tsunami. Um, obviously, clearing out of a lot of the Infrastructure was evident post and also not, notif not identifiable here, but there was loss of, um, or you'd see um, corpses as well. So looking at the policy context, Samoa in the 1990s went through some class five cyclones, Cyclone Ofa and Cyclone Valelia. At that particular point in time, we lost about $500 million worth of in Samoan dollars um, infrastructure and loss of life. At that time, we did not have um, a clear policy mandate on how to deal with disaster management. So following that event, um, the World Bank got full behind us and started to look at integrating and starting to look at approaches in dealing with disaster management. And this was reflected in Samoa's macroeconomic framework, which is the strategy for the development of Samoa. Um, within that document, it outlined the relevance of disaster management, which also led to the development of the disaster and emergency management legislation, which really started to look at the institutions and the coordination mechanisms that are required under um, crisis. So you're looking at establishing cabinets, um, disaster management council, which basically is the command and control office of government. You've also got the Disaster Advisory Committee, which are basically all your utilities and all your public sector authorities together with your NGOs at the executive level, sitting around the table, making decisions and advising government. And on the ground, you've got the Disaster Management Office that deal with the day-to-day -day operations. With the operational side of things, we did have our headquarters based at Fale um, just within the urban center, um, Faleata. So, um, a lot of the operations were um, um, circulated through that avenue, heading out to the rural and remote areas. In terms of the planning framework, we, did ha we do have a national disaster management plan, which outlines all the responsibilities and the actions required under um, emergency status. In terms of the assessments that were carried out immediately, 
Um, this was the damage and loss assessment, which looked at all the sectors and the impact um, from an economic perspective, which totaled about $310 million um, in San Montala. So there was wide impacts in terms of um, tourism operations from the commercial side, but you're also looking at the infrastructure as well as the housing um, that was uh, directly affected in terms of connections, power, roads, and also agriculture and fisheries. So the environment by default was adversely impacted from the coral up until the um, coastline and even up until the ridge, so the foothills of a lot of the cliff faces along that coastal margin were also damaged. So approximately looking at the damage assessment, we, from the government's perspective, looked at a reconstruction effort which totaled about 450 million. And a lot of that was directed through the relief fund that was established through the various um, contributions made not only by our bilateral partners, but also from the private sector. Um, civil societies overseas, as well as the international community in terms of the World Bank, ADB, contributed for $40 million for emergency response. Australia contributed about $8 million to environmental protection and disaster planning. Um, I guess without saying automatically, government um, offered their support, and by default, a lot of the decision-making procedures were circuited for obvious reasons to make sure that uh, people were rehabilitated as soon as possible. Um, and the recovery plan that was put in place looked at building back better, trying to make sure that these principles looked at infrastructure and better resilience and possibly relocation of settlement was obviously one of the clear areas of um, importance, not only for settlement planning, but also relocation of infrastructure so that they're outside these hazard, hazard areas. So again, just drawing from the challenges um, that were presented throughout this um, event, um, it almost appears that we muddled through it, but I don't think we did. Uh, we had from preparation of the policy context what we needed to do in the extensive and the adequacy of our preparedness, I believe, um, contributed to the saving a lot of lives that could have been lost. Um, so some of the challenges that are quite clear was the, from the government's perspective was to minimize the adversity on the people um, by making sure that the rehabilitation was done immediately, dealing with the social and political consequences where um, psychological impacts were um, clearly noted. Um, in terms of the spirit of rationalization, a lot of it led to the elements of Christianity and trying to look at, well, this serves a larger purpose and people accepting their loss as opposed to getting muddled down and depressed, as you would say. In fact, they didn't have time to be depressed. Um, for government, it was about trying to restore public faith in the future, um, as you can imagine, particularly with what's going on in Christchurch and what happened in Japan and also what happened in Samoa is that you've got a lot of um, work and effort to go into restoring people's ability to see life as usual or um, get back on the business as usual path. So in terms of government's coordination and that ability to collaborate and make sure the infrastructure's back and people's lives are as normal as possible, that was one of the critical priorities of government. Fostering crisis coordination and communication when you're looking at a whole of government approach um, we were fortunate enough to have the legislation in place and we had some simulations um, done pri prior to the tsunami. In fact, we were more concerned about um, cyclones than tsunamis, so we were pretty much gearing up for the cyclone season. But having that experience going through the preparedness and the planning phases, I think that also led to, I guess, contributing to the level of uh, loss of life that may have occurred had we not gone through that process. So again, fostering that coordination and communication so that all uh, roles and responsibilities are clear and even at the village level that they know that um, when we receive these warnings or there are triggers that allow us to identify um, escape routes and that should be part of the plan which um, is included under the disaster plan. Um, crisis termination transition into normal public sector operations. 
this was a huge dilemma for us um, in terms of after the event, all of government's resources were and effort were put behind serving these communities. Um, a lot of our works are, uh, were put on hold. Our planning and urban management agency responses in terms of development control as you would have under the city council systems were basically waived during this period. Um, so it does put a bit of demand on um, your current operations. I think from a political perspective is to know when to draw the line, um, which can be a bit um, troublesome, um, but I guess for Samoa's experience, we looked at a three-year recovery plan, which amounted to about $480 uh, million. But again, just knowing that we were going through a three-year recovery period was important for us to know that, okay, this is the start and the end of the disaster. I don't believe our colleagues in New Zealand feel the same way about what's going on with their earthquake situation. So in terms of trying to draw the connection from the remote and rural environment and some of the current thinking within the city, I think it is important for us to incorporate disaster risk reduction for our urban infrastructure and some of the new initiatives that we've been looking at have been looking at best international practice both from Australia and New Zealand trying to develop a city development strategy from a, a larger framework and then have that also parallel with the RPA spatial plan. So looking at the positive things about drawing in urban governance and decision making around sustainable development has been critical for us. Um, just on that note, considering we're a central government authority, we don't have an urban boundary as I mentioned earlier, which complicates it even further. So what we're doing in right, what, where we're at right now is trying to have that discussion and make sure that these um, plans are in place to best serve urban development. We've also upgraded our coastal infrastructure management strategy and those management plans that have been in effect, which are largely non-statutory and about encouraging and discouraging certain practices within coastal hazard zones. So we're looking at um, developing evacuation plans also under that framework so that people are quite clear about their infrastructure for escape. We are working together with the World Bank in developing our pilot program for climate resilience, looking at infrastructure along the coastal margins and, uh, and climate proofing those, um, those facilities. Um, we're also working closely with the World Bank on their disaster risk reduction policy note, which also informs a lot of the infrastructure decisions that we are currently making um, in terms of climate change. And uh, finally, um, the revised disaster management plan is really looking at um, how we can best coordinate urban responses. So again, learning from that experience, trying to draw out and get prepared for 